got a monster weekend recap. NDSU scores a big win over UND. And the Vikings are still unbeaten. Overreaction Monday on Hot Mike starts right now. Hot Mike with Dom Izzo. Really? Really, Dom? No. I like what Dom's doing. Okay. Dom Izzo. Jeez. Come on, Dom. What do you think I am, a magician? Yeah, I'm fired up, Dom. What else could I say? Absolutely. I was great to get on the field, and then Dom came up to me, and I'm trying to walk away from me. I just wanted to enjoy myself out there. Hot mic. Great job. <laughs> There's got to be some kind of intelligent question about something. Is a coach Dom Izzo, WDAY in Fargo, North Dakota. Can you give me a layup or something? Hot Mike. Hot Mike. That program is second to none. On the networks of WDAY. You know, if it's not about sports, I find it very hard to concentrate. Here's Dom Izzo. Dom Izzo. Good Monday morning. Welcome to the... I guess that was a busy weekend edition of Hot Mike on WDAY KSFL TV. Hello, Sioux Falls. We'll see you tomorrow. And in forum.com, seventh day of October 2024, ready to rock and roll. It is beautiful outside. It's a perfect fall day, perfect fall weekend as well. A little windy, but that comes with the territory. Welcome to the show, everybody. Hope you all had a great weekend. Took in whatever that you wanted to do. It is October. Good day to be out. Pumpkin patch, corn maze, football. That's kind of the that's the triumvirate there uh, for this time of the year. And we certainly had our variety of options this weekend. Uh, the dome was rocking, as we expected. Uh, it didn't after halftime. That was the thing we talked about. Despite the fact the game was what it was, it was a 24 to 10 at halftime. Um, it didn't have the same uh, atmosphere for the second half of that football game. And granted, the Bison pulled away, but uh, we did not have it for the whole game on Saturday. Tailgate lot certainly felt like it, despite it was a bit breezy out there. It was, it was certainly rocking there. So, yeah, that. The Vikes win yesterday, which we're going to show you in a minute here after they beat the Jets. I'll flip the helmet over here in a minute. We'll do that. Uh, and they're 5-0. and 5-0. and When we were in Las Vegas, I looked. The under-over in the Vikings' win total was 6.5 for the season. They have five wins and five tries heading into their bye week. It's just, uh, that's the story of the NFL. It really, To me, it is. Sit here in Fargo, North Dakota, in Fargo, North Dakota, and tell you that they are five and zero. Tell me a better story than the Minnesota Vikings right now. I'll wait. I don't think there is one. And then the baseball playoffs, which I get it. People are maybe tuned out because the Twins didn't make it, but yet there are three AL Central teams still playing. Um, if this is what we're going to have consistently and nightly for the next month in the baseball postseason, they'll get people to watch. The two games yesterday, one was an absolute classic. The other was an off-the-rails and borderline rock concert. Um, that will get eyeballs to it. I, the NFL rules all, and you'll see it tonight because the Chiefs are playing tonight, and there's two baseball games, including the Yankees. And the ratings will be two to one in favor of football. But if we get the kind of drama that we've had in the baseball diamond consistently for the next month, then look out. We'll show you that uh, in a bit as well. We'll also recap the best of the weekend, which we do each and every Monday, including a historic win uh, in the hockey rink, which we'll, uh, we'll get into that in full coming up later on in the show. But we'll start with the Vikings over in London facing Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. Jets had scuffled in their last game, lost, didn't even score a touchdown the last time out, and Rodgers throws a touchdown to the other team. Andrew Van Ginkle, former South Dakota great, with a pick six to start the game. That was Rodgers' already second interception of the game, a 63-yard pick six, and it's 10-0. And it got worse. He throws another one. Where's that one going? Cam Bynum comes up with a pick. The Vikings got out to a 17 to nothing lead. I went to the grocery store at that point after CJ Ham scored because the game was over. 
but the Jets got back into it because of bad Vikings special teams. This touchdown to Garrett Wilson makes it a 20 to 17 score. Vikings get a field goal, make it 23 17, and Rodgers throws another interception. That one from Stephon Gilmore to seal the game. The guy they added right before the season began. And the Minnesota Vikings beat the Jets 23 to 17. The final score. Vikes defense, the story of the day. Not the offense, because they petered out after Aaron Jones left this game. Sam Darnold was only 14 of 31 for 179 yards and an interception. Rodgers throws three picks in the game. Garrett Wilson had his best game by far of the season. But you see, Brees Hall was held to 23 yards in the game. Jefferson, six receptions for 92 yards and he drew about, I don't know, 50 yards in penalties as well yesterday. But the Vikes are 5-0. and And after the game, pretty excited about heading back home with five wins to open the year. Um, so many things that, uh, so many moments in that game, so many things we talked about going into this football game that uh, materialized, especially uh, got to give it up for our defense flow and those guys. Uh, we needed them today. Uh, it was not good enough uh, to our standard on offense. And uh, moments like this are where we lean into a lot of things that our organization's built off of. Um, adversity, dealing with adversity together, no flinch, all three sides figuring out a way to come together and win a football game. Um, what I told our team is there's going to be days like this. And when there's days like this, uh, good football teams find a way to pick each other up against, you know, a future Hall of Fame quarterback and, you know, tough circumstances, kind of a sloppy day um, all the way around with a little spit and rain and all those things. There's a thousand excuses out there. Our team didn't look for any of them. Uh, they just kept playing. Will Reichert was phenomenal for us when we needed three. He got it. Uh, and like I said, our defense um, just just lights out. I think our defense, our special teams played out of their minds today. Um, and I think as an offense, you know, I think we just got to find a way to continue to play consistent football. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pre-snap penalties, um, the communication um, just has to continue to get better. But, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a whole, I feel like we were able to make plays when we needed to. Um, but we just got to continue to get better that way. They're 5-0. and oh. They are 5-0. and oh. Just, again, wrap your mind around that. When we look at the NFC North standings, who would have thought that? Zero. The Vikes are 5-0. and oh. The Lions are off this week. The Bears won because they were playing Carolina. And the Packers won as they beat the Rams yesterday, which we'll show you in a minute. But if you look as the Vikes head into their bye week right now, 5 and 0, oh, Lions are 3 and 1, Packers 3 and 2, Bears 3 and 2. Everybody over 500 in the NFC North after maybe a slower start to the year. Um that's you put Minnesota and Washington in the conversations. The Commanders are 4 and 1 and Jaden Daniels is playing maybe like the MVP. Forget rookie of the year, he's playing like MVP of the National Football League. Those are the two best stories going in the NFL. The Chiefs are unbeaten. Okay, stunner. They have Patrick Mahomes. The Texans are good. Everybody thought that. The only team that the Texans have lost to are the Vikings. Houston's 4-1. and one. Everybody else in the AFC is 3-2. and two. Ravens are 3-2. and two. Bills are 3-2. and two. Rodgers and the Jets are now 2-3. and three. Cowboys are 3-2. and two. Eagles have lost twice. San Francisco is scuffling. They got beat yesterday by the Cardinals. They're 2-3. and three. So... We sit here on August or October 7th. Pretty easy to say. The NFC is wide open, and the Minnesota Vikings have a heck of a chance in it. Bye week, then it's the Lions. And we got to see Aaron Jones left the game. KOC said as well afterwards that it's a hip thing. Good, he's got a chance to get a week off. And by the time they play, the Lions should be ready to go. Because remember, they play two games in the span of five days out of the bye because they go to or they host the Lions and then they go to the Rams on a Thursday night after that. And then remember, we talked about that once we get to November, that is the soft spot of the Vikings schedule. 
with a bunch of AFC South teams that are there for the Vikes. So monster win yesterday. And for the Jets, I, I got nothing for you. They, we, they, we had this experiment with Aaron Rodgers, and it seems Rodgers looked like, and we don't have the video here, but we, when he got hurt on the play between him and uh, he got his uh, legs wrapped up, he looked like it was a 1,000 years old. And I know he's no spring chicken, but on that particular play, he crawled off the field. He looked like it was 800. And I, just conspiracy there. It looks like either he hates Sala or Sala is already fed up with Rodgers. I, I know it happened last year with everything off the field, and Rodgers was talking about the team when he wasn't there. I'm sure that went over well with the head coach. And already they've been... They had that weird interaction on the sideline when, uh, on the Thursday night game when Rodgers shoved him or whatever. and they, I, It's not good. And now they have a Monday night game this coming week. A week from tonight, they play the Bills. And Buffalo is scuffling now because they've lost two in a row. It's just something is not right with that team. They should be better than two and three. Frankly, they should be four and one. The only game they I thought they were completely outclassed was the opener against the 49ers. They beat the Titans, and the Titans aren't very good. Then they beat the Patriots, and the Patriots aren't very good. But the game against Denver, and I know Denver now looks maybe better than we thought because they've won three in a row. The game against the Broncos, they look completely lost. They couldn't do anything offensively. And Don't give me weather. I know the weather was bad. And then this game, three picks? I can have – Sam Darnold could throw three picks. We didn't need to get rid of him for that. That part was extremely frustrating. So the Jets lose, right? Rest of the day, okay, enjoy it. Mets game starting at 3 o'clock. Mets won the opener Saturday evening against Philly. And full disclosure, I had the score up in the booth. I was not watching the game. I would look during commercial breaks to see what the score was. And as we signed off the air, the Mets had taken a 5-1 to one lead and beat Philly in game one. They beat the Phillies in Philadelphia. Over the moon on that on Saturday night. So now game two. Remember now, it's best of five in the divisional round. So you get this one. Then you're going back to New York for at least two, knowing full well that they can have a chance to close it out at home. And like I mentioned off the top, the baseball playoffs have been ridiculous. Let's show you the two games yesterday. The first one in Philly was amazing. I know if you're watching football yesterday, you missed it. The Mets built a 3-0 lead till the bottom of the sixth inning. Luis Severino hits a wall as Nick Castellanos just crushes that. Back-to-back home runs for the Phillies. Ties the game at three. But the Mets come right back in the top of the seventh. Brandon Nimmo hits a home run, and the Mets go back in front at four to three. It would stay that way until the bottom of the eighth. Bryson Stott in, and this is laced down the right field line. It's a triple to score two runs. The Phillies would go on top. Five to four. They'd add another run, and it's a six-four Philly lead going to the top of the ninth. But the Mets have done this before in the ninth inning. Mark Vientos, who had a home run earlier, hits another off Matt Strom, a two-run shot in the top of the ninth, and the Mets have tied the game again in the ninth inning at six all. Much like they did to the Brewers last week, they did it to the Phillies. Now. Runners in the corners, bottom of the ninth. Castellanos delivers with a base hit. That would score Trey Turner with a winning run. And the Phillies walk off the Mets 7-6. to six. By the way, the reaction they had, like they won the World Series. Let's pump the brakes here. They won a walk-off, so the series tied at a game apiece. Now to the game in L.A. And this one was scary because the Phillies, or excuse me, the Padres took it to the Dodgers. Last night, Jackson Merrill goes the opposite way for a base hit here. That would make it a 5-1 
Phil, uh, Padre lead. The game got nasty. Jerks and Profar was talking to the crowd. He robbed a home run. They started throwing things on the field. You can see they threw baseballs at him. Delayed the game for 20 minutes last night. It got downright nasty between the fans and the Padres. You see, they were throwing things. It got even worse between the players. Fernando Tatis Jr. bombs a home run. That's a two-run shot. That made it a 10-1 San Diego lead. You can see they were talking smack to each other last night. The Padres won it. Final score was 10-2. So that series now is a game apiece as well, heading back to San Diego for game three coming up on Tuesday. So here's the up-to-date playoff bracket. Uh, the Phillies and the Mets at one all. Padres and the Dodgers at one all. They'll have a travel day today. That series will resume on Tuesday. The American League resumes after a day off yesterday with the Yankees leading the Royals one game to none and the Guardians up one zip on the Tigers. And we'll feature more of that coming up in What to Watch later on in the show. But that was the backdrop for each of those games yesterday. Just a crazy, crazy couple of games. The Mets are playing cardiac kids this playoff run. Just that's what they've decided to do. Started a week ago today and how they beat Atlanta. And then they carried it over how they beat uh, the Brewers. Carried over to Saturday because they exploded in the eighth inning. They had done nothing for seven innings of that game. Exploded there and then won it and then did it again last night. That was the first time they actually lost. But we'll see with that series shifting back to New York for game three coming up on Tuesday. Last thing before we set up our show, the other massive sporting event, Minnesota Lynx had a chance to eliminate Connecticut yesterday. WNBA semifinals. The Lynx won Friday to go up two games to one. Best of five. So if they win, they're going to the finals to get the New York Liberty. That was the backdrop for game four yesterday in Connecticut. But Reminder, the Sun were the third best team in the league this year. The Lynx were second, the Liberty were first. And as luck would have it, we're going to have a fifth game because the Sun are tough to beat at home. Game four yesterday, Nafisa Collier was great. Again, had a quiet game in game two, came alive yesterday. This is a fabulous up and under move there. She had 29 points and 13 rebounds. She did everything she could for the Lynx. But the Sun, playing at home, got hot late in the third quarter. Listen, Thomas scores there. She had 18, this three. They finally made some shots. They couldn't make anything on Friday night. Mabry hits a three, put them up three. This, another one, put them up 10 late in the fourth quarter. They pull away after that. Another corner three. That put the lead at 16. They got up by one point as much as 18 in the fourth quarter to pull away and beat the Lynx. 92-82, the final score. So the series now tied at two games apiece. There will be a game five. That will be on Tuesday night at Target Center in Minneapolis. The winner will get, as I mentioned, the Liberty, who eliminated the Aces yesterday. The Aces, who had won the last two WNBA championships, but will have a new a uh, winner here in 2024, and we'll see if the Lynx can get back to the finals. they got a game five coming up tomorrow night at Target Center. That will be rocking. We got a packed show on tap for you today. We'll salute our best of the weekend coming up here in just a couple minutes. At 935, Sam Hurd will be back with us in his usual Monday time slot. We'll recap the best of what we saw from the FCS this weekend. A couple of upsets. We had three top ten teams lose this weekend how that shakes up the poll and the national stage. That's coming up at 9.35. Jeff Kolpak will be with us at 10 o'clock. Unpack the Bison victory over UND. Cam Miller's status. You saw he left the game on Saturday. And where things go from here, the Bison have officially six games in. They're halfway through their season. They start the back half coming up this weekend in Carbondale. And at 10.35, Josh Morton will join us. Augustana Athletic Director after the Vikings had a monster win Saturday night in Grand Forks. I know it was an exhibition game, but Augie beat UND at the Ralph. 
four to one. They dominated the hockey game. Uh, we'll get Morty's reaction to that. And uh, fittingly enough, it was Bison UND weekend. So uh, we'll talk to Josh about that and much more coming up at ten thirty-five. That your emails are already pouring in. We got a busy show. Glad you're joining us. Overreaction Monday just getting started. We're back after this on WDAY Extra, KSFL TV, and Inforum.com. All right, we do it each and every Monday. We salute our best of the weekend. A lot of nominees here. We have plenty coming in. We'll start. We don't normally do the NFL and best of the weekend, but there are three certain plays and players saw yesterday have monster games like you know what saw all those guys right here in Fargo reminder that there's pretty good football that's played in this level we'll start with the Vikes game yesterday we featured him in the highlight reel had a pick six Andrew Van Ginkle for the Vikings people don't know this maybe forgot it because it's nine years ago Van Ginkle, who finished his career at Wisconsin, he transferred there from Iowa Western. He started his career at South Dakota, which we'll show you in a minute. Then last night, near midnight, Hunter Lipke had a monster reception for Dallas. Got them within striking range. The Cowboys are going in wind. And then South Dakota State alum, Tucker Kraft, was gargantuan for the Packers yesterday at this 66-yard touchdown. That was the first of two. Had another one here from Jordan Love later, his best game as a pro. All those guys played in the Missouri Valley Football Conference. Just a reminder there. You had a guy from South Dakota, guy from NESU, guy from South Dakota State. All had huge games yesterday in the NFL. Here's your refresher on Van Ginkle, by the way. 2015, he was the Missouri Valley Freshman of the Year. That was the year that South Dakota stunned the Bison. Number 17 out there was amazing in that game. I never heard of him prior to this game. He only played one year at USD because then I think everybody realized, like, oh, my gosh, this guy. Look, at him. he pounded Carson Wentz into the turf on that play. He ended up winning Valley Freshman of the Year. And this is long before the portal because he wouldn't have transferred to a community college. They're a sack on Wentz. He was tremendous. He's gone on and had a great NFL career. And the Vikings, when they signed him from Miami, I'm like, well, this guy's good. No one, I saw him play, obviously, in the pros. He's only gotten better. And I think Viking fans now would uh, attest to that. I put this clip out yesterday on my Twitter feed. It blew up. Got like 70,000 views or something crazy like that. Yeah, he was pretty good in his college days starting in Vermilion. Shout out to the Golden Gophers. We don't salute them on Best of the Weekend often either, but Saturday night, got home after the Bison game, flipped on the Gophers' second half of their game with USC. Again, USC is playing in Minneapolis. Have to wrap our minds around that. Tight game. We pick it up at 17-all at Huntington Bank Stadium. Controversy here. The Gophers go for it on fourth and goal. They score. Max Brosmer, we think it's into the end zone. We still have no idea. They say it's a touchdown. So the Gophers lead it 24-17. USC has one last chance to try and tie the football game. Coy Parrish, young man from Esco, who's the top recruit in the state of Minnesota this past year comes up with the game ceiling pick that is a fabulous play Parrish fended off the Ohio State there was a bunch of schools after him he decided to stay home and gets Minnesota its biggest win probably in five years since they beat Penn State and that ended up getting them college game day a couple of weeks later that's a monster win for P.J. Fleck after how badly they looked at Iowa, and they nearly beat Michigan, we know, last week. Gophers are now 3-3 three and three after that win. And the other two wins they had, they beat Rhode Island. They beat Nevada. That's nobody. 
They didn't look good in the second half of their game with Iowa. Thought they played better against Michigan. And frankly, maybe they should have won. But the win on Saturday night is a biggie. Now, they go on the road and take on UCLA on Saturday. Go to the Rose Bowl. Think about that again. The Gophers playing in the Rose Bowl. Wild. Last thing on our best of the weekend. Congratulations to the Augustana hockey team. We saluted them a couple times last year. Now beginning their second year of Division I play. They got a game with the University of North Dakota on the schedule, which was a big deal. We visited about Brad Berry with that. You'll see that in our latest edition of the sit-down, which will be on later this week on WDAY+. And then Augie decides to ruin the party. The Vikings came in, and they took it to UND. They scored early and often against the Fighting Hawks in the first period. Rebound goal there. Crash in the net. I mean, they played this game like it counted. They played like we're ready to go for the regular season. Can't say the same about UND. And I know people are going to stop me and the UND fans will say it's an exhibition. I will simply say to you that, okay, you only get one of them. Augie looked like the team that was raring to go on Saturday night. That's a huge win for their pro. And we talked about it last year. They had a couple of big time rank wins. They're getting good players. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. We're going to visit more about this with Josh Morton coming up at 1035. But congratulations to Augie. They go in. It's not like they beat him in Sioux Falls. That'd be one thing. They beat him at the Ralph in Grand Forks. Congratulations to the Vikings. That's a huge win there. We'll break. We come back. Sam Herter will join us to recap the week that was in the FCS, and we look ahead now to the second half. We're getting near bracketology time. More. On Welcome back, everybody. Monday morning edition of Hot Mike rolls on. We missed him last week, so uh, we're glad we got Sam Herter back at his usual Monday time slot, and a lot to cover as we've now officially reached the halfway mark, which is crazy. We talk about it all offseason. Now it just goes by uh, of the FCS season. We had three, I counted three, top 10 teams uh, lose this weekend. Two I would consider upset. One I'm, I would not say that was just a, a flat-out win. Um, let's start with the game in Fargo. The Bison won. The Bison won emphatically. What does that do for – let's start with NDSU before we get to UND in your mind. Yeah, I think it kind of just – these last two week, weeks really it changes the narrative a little bit about the Bison because um, we already, you know, hashed out the ETSU game and how that happened. And even even the Towson game, um, you know, for a little bit was, was kind of iffy and kind of sitting here going, you know, I think, you know, the Bison looking, looking a little up and down, but they'll probably figure things out by the end of the year like they did last year. But it seems like they're already figuring things out now with two back-to-back -back dominant – ranked wins um and if you want to count etsu we'll see where they're at in the rankings but that could be three now ranked wins for ndsu now all of a sudden we go from yeah i don't know about ndsu yeah. they'll be good but i don't know how good now i think they're the number two team for sure you can make an argument that they're the number one team um just with how they've looked these last two weeks it seems like that improvement we've been waiting for that happened late last year it seems like it's happening right now which is good timing because this is kind of in the thick of the toughest stretch of the of the schedule and i'd throw by the way towson got a big win over william and mary so look out yep. the tigers might crawl into that receiving votes category today after what they did yeah and, and towson bef a week before i think it was a week before ndsu almost beat villanova Correct. and so that was a, a, another quality win for for ndsu beating towson so with the way that the bison have looked especially defensively and this is the middle part of their toughest stretch and now suddenly Southern Illinois, and we'll talk about this with Colpac coming up in our second hour. SIU looks like they've hit the skids. That game with the Jackrabbits could very well be for top spot in not only the Missouri Valley, but maybe the number one seed for the FCS playoffs. We're talking, and that's only in week eight? Yeah, um, it's going to have huge implications. Yeah. And, yeah, if the Bison make it through this stretch – you know, without a loss, which going to Southern Illinois, that that doesn't look, you know, as challenging anymore. SIU is so beat up down to their third quarterback. Um, you get South Dakota State at home. 
Um, that's probably going to be a 50-50 type of game, but, you know, just with how motivated NDSU look, looks and it being in the Fargo Dome, um, you know, maybe NDSU will be slightly favored there. Um, and then from there, I think that last regular season game at South Dakota Yipper. could be tough, but things ease up um, after the South Dakota State game. And then same thing with South Dakota State. I know they still have, you know, like Youngstown State this week. That should be a win. Uh, South Dakota State still has to play. South Dakota, they also have to go to UND. And so South Dakota State still has some tough games ahead. But it seems both teams are going to win this week. And then whoever wins the following week yeah. is in the Dakota marker game is going to be in the driver's seat for that number one seed. We will, I believe we're going to hear today the time and channel for the SDSU-NDSU game that could happen while we're on the air. So we'll share that once we uh, hear that. But it's likely going to be one versus two. I hope ESPN considers that more than ESPNU. I really do. That's the that's the the trouble you run into. I'm trying to think of the best word, Sam, to describe it. Because if you're going to play this game at 11 a.m., there's only a certain amount of channels. Like Montana State and Idaho are going to play late, but they're going to get ESPN two because they're going to play at 9:15 on Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, frankly, ESPNU is it's national television, but it's, I've seen the numbers; they're yeah. not good. Nope. I mean, they thirty thousand people uh, sometimes, and even even in the FBS, you know, yeah. I've seen some. Uh, like last year, I remember James Madison played someone. Um, I can't remember who, but it was on ESPNU, and that got like forty five thousand viewers. And then a Big Sky game on ESPNU got like fifty thousand viewers. Like it's not if you're on ESPN two, you can get. 300,000 maybe if you're on ESPN you can get 500,000 600,000 and so if I don't know where it's going to land or on or what day or, or what time I should say but if it is ESPN you you kind of go eh, how do, yeah. it's it's national television but it's not like it's not it's not the best channel channel to be on and the, pro- the problem is and it's not a problem but the fact they're going to keep it on Saturday if they move it to Friday they'd have an unbelievable opportunity to get some more eyeballs because Saturday that day Georgia plays Texas and Alabama plays Tennessee. Last I checked, the SEC is <laughs> awfully good, and ESPN now has a new deal with the SEC that they're probably going to give those da- those games and those channels to to those teams. And that's the tough balance too, because right. if you do move the game to Friday, it's more TV friendly, but it's probably not as fan uh, fan friendly because I know a lot of Bison fans travel from you know afar to to make these games. So that's. That's kind of the balance. Um, I don't know if there was flexibility in this game to, to move it to a Friday or if they always wanted to stick on Saturday. But, yeah, options are limited yeah. on Saturday, and we'll see we'll, we'll see what time they, they kick off. I mentioned this on Bison Game Day about the Jackrabbits that seemed like almost out of sight, out of mind. They, they struggled the last time we saw with Augie and didn't have not looked as crisp as we certainly saw last year. I think that changed Saturday, Sam. They came out. I know Northern Iowa is what they are but they flattened Northern Iowa Saturday night. Yeah, I think it was, well, I was about to say, I think it was a statement performance. I Maybe, maybe not. Northern Iowa is really down yep. this year. I mean, let's just be honest. I know they were ranked number 17 or 18 in the coaches poll. So I guess it kind of counts as a ranked win <laughs> on South Dakota State's resume, but Northern Iowa shouldn't have been ranked. Nope. I mean, they almost lost to, uh, to the Tommies of St. Thomas earlier uh, this year, but I still thought, South Dakota State overall defensively has looked really good, really all year long. Um, running game has looked strong all season long, but the passing game it seems like it's starting to click um, after the bye week. So it was it was a complete performance, and you're right in that we just with South Dakota State like they got a lot of attention after beating UIW because that was a ranked win. But other than that, we haven't talked about the Jacks a whole lot, and really the same thing with Montana State. The Bobcats got a lot of attention after their FBS. And, but they've kind of just been beaten up on Correct. on you know not not very good opponents and so those two teams we're keeping an eye on them we're just not really talking about them as much because they just the games they're playing we, there just hasn't been much much to talk about so their uh, business will about to pick up now for South Dakota State and Montana <laughs> That's State a good way to they, put they it. have some ranked opponents upcoming. That's a good way to put it. I think when I look at that they're still the most talented team out there. Are they as good as last year? No. Do I still think they're the most talented? Absolutely. Could they win this whole thing? Sure. Because that's that's just what they have out there in the Jackrabbits. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely not like last year where it was South Dakota State yeah. versus the field. This year, it, it's not like it's a wide open field at all. But um, you probably, if there was futures odds out there right now on the FCS National Championship, you probably put South Dakota State like plus 200. Then North Dakota State is probably like plus 
250. Like yeah. they're, they're probably pretty close there. But um, I, I do think with South Dakota State defensively, um, in my opinion, I think they're the best defense in the FCS right now. You know, NDSU by this point might have something to say about that. Um, but then offensively for South Dakota State, they're – their backfield is so loaded. Um, I think the Jacks offensive line has been playing really good. Um, Griffin Wilby is really good at wide receiver. Uh, Mark Ranowski is still, you know, one of, he's probably still the yep. number two or three quarterback in the FCS right now. Cam Miller being number one, but he's still obviously a really good quarterback. So they have the pieces in place uh, to three Pete, but they are uh, definitely going to be challenged uh, a lot more uh, this year, especially going to Fargo in a couple of weeks. That could be the difference between, NDSU being at home in the semifinals yep. or being on the road in the semifinals and same thing with South Dakota State in the semifinals, depending on that Dakota marker game. You know this stat. I'll share this for our viewers and listeners. Montana State has six wins, not counting the New Mexico win. The teams that they've beat have combined to win eight games of those five teams. Two of them are winless. So I moved the Bison ahead of them simply uh, back on that. Strength of schedule, the Bison have – the, I say three rank wins, maybe a fourth with Towson, and Montana State with their FBS win, great. They haven't beaten anybody, and I know they're going to play. They got Idaho this weekend, and they still have the Grizz at the end of the year, and you can't worry about who you schedule because the big sky is random on that, but they haven't beaten anybody. That's why I dropped them. Yeah, I, I, I flipped NDSU and Montana State as well. The, the Bison to number two, Montana State to number three, and even if you want to throw the New Mexico win into that mix, yeah. I think New Mexico is one and four uh, <laughs> right now. So, so it's an FBS win, but there's definitely levels to what type of FBS win you have. I still think eye test wise, you know, Montana State um, is passing the eye test. I think they're playing much again. You, you have to gauge opponents here, but we've seen some ranked teams just kind of squeak by inferior opponents yes. and that hasn't been the case for montana state so you have to give them credit there um, i think defensively they, they, they look much better than they did last year um offensively i think is the best in the fcs their offensive line might be the best in the fcs they have two future nfl guys that are already getting nfl hype and we know if you want to win a national title you need at least two nfl guys <laughs> on your offensive line that's how high the bar is with what south Dakota state and north Dakota state have said i think montana state is there Passing game looks more comfortable. Tommy Malat looks more comfortable. He's not running as much. And so Montana State looks the part. But, again, you kind of weigh that up against the opponents that are playing. And right. so um, now moving forward, yeah, they have Idaho this week. I think that's a ESPN2 game, um, late night kick. Uh, they have UC Davis in November, I think, in Montana as well at the end of the year. So they have an opportunity for at least three more uh, ranked wins. Um, so if they go undefeated and, let's say, North Dakota State doesn't lose again, that's a pretty tight race for the number one seed. And I guess it doesn't matter if you're one or two, but Montana state might also, I think it's going to be in the running for the number one or number two seed. Cause I, I kind of think they're going to run the table from here on really? out. Uh, their schedule sets up nicely. The game at UC Davis later on might be tough. Cause I think that's a week before the Montana game. Uh, but I think the cats have a chance to go uh, 12 and 0 this year. I think Ooh. they, they look the part to do right. so. Let's stay in the big sky. Weber goes and beats Montana. Uh, in overtime, they score 55 on the Grizz. Uh, let's take this either way you want to go, either on Weber or Montana out of what happened Saturday in Missoula. Yeah, I think, I mean, Weber is tough to figure out because <laughs> they that was a huge win for them, and they did it on the road, but they also lost the two Southland teams who Correct. were not ranked at the time. Now, they, they, <laughs> they I think Lamar is probably still going to be ranked. McNeese just lost pretty big to, uh, I think it was Houston, Houston Christian. Houston and so Christian, yep. You kind of, you kind of question what exactly Weber state is, but uh, they got a huge win there uh, going to Montana. Then for the Grizz, I mean, they've allowed, let's see, they've allowed 35, 49 and 55 points in the last three games, which is just That's not uncharacteristic good. for a uh, Bobby Hout coach, coach team. It's, it's like they have Bob Stitt, you know, <laughs> back on the coaching staff and they're winning these games or losing these games in, in shootout fashion. And I think Montana's offense is really, really good. Like they have two good quarterbacks. Their receivers are awesome. Eli Gilman is really good. I think their offensive line is looking good. But defensively, they just, you know, the safeties are pretty experienced for the Grizz, but they're not playing well. You know, the cornerback spot opposite of Grandney, it's struggling a bit. Um, I mean, Riley Wilson is a really good linebacker. I think Hayden Harris is really good on the edge as well, but they just, it's, 
they get beat over the top and it allows so many explosive plays where you wonder, is it the players? Is it, is it the scheme? Like what's going on? There just seems to be so many explosive plays where it's just, there, there's no yeah. resistance for Montana's defense, which is so odd to see. And I, it, it's kind of seems like it's fixable because it seems like it's more mental mistakes than physical mistakes. But at the same time, this is now three weeks in a row of, of allowing 35, 49 and 55 points. So I, I think Montana is still going to end up in the playoffs, but I just they, yeah. they have a lot to figure out. Central Arkansas got beat by Abilene Christian, which uh, Abilene's ranked. They've played well. You see, I don't think we expected UCA to get beat. At least I didn't, Sam. Would that one raise some eyebrows for you? It did, yeah, especially with Central Arkansas getting a lot of momentum behind it because they were undefeated. Um, they really should have had an, uh, an FBS win over Arkansas State if not for some – um, you know, re- controversial review uh, stuff happening at the end of of that game, and you know, I, I going to Abilene Christian and losing maybe isn't too much of a surprise because Abilene Christian is you know they're four and two overall, yep. and their two losses are one possession games to Texas Tech in overtime, and then Idaho was a one possession yep. game as well. So Abilene seems to be you know decently strong. Um, it kind of zaps momentum in the hype behind Central Arkansas um, a little bit, but I still think. Central Arkansas could be a pretty tough out in the playoffs just because, um, you know, offensively, I think they could really challenge uh, some teams with what they're doing. So um, I still like Central Arkansas. I think Abilene is on the rise as well. But that one was was one I wasn't expecting. Email comes in. Dom and Sam, how come no love for the other South Dakota team? All right, we'll give it. The Coyotes here dusted Southern Illinois. They routed Murray State. What do we make of USD here, Sam? Are we not paying enough attention to what the Coyotes have done? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good call-out because this is now two weeks in a row yep. where South Dakota has looked really good. They, they beat up on, you know, they got a ranked win uh, last week, and then they um, they beat up on Murray State uh, this week. And so that, that was another program where we just weren't talking a whole lot about through the first four weeks because they didn't play a yeah. Division One or an FCS scholarship team uh, until uh, uh, two games uh, ago. But uh, I think South Dakota has kind of answered some questions about them because they were kind of – hit or miss when it comes to people's opinions on the Yotes was last year, you know, a one-time thing. Are they going to build off of that? Um, I think defensively uh, they're looking strong. Um, Offensively, they look more explosive last year. Um, And we knew they have, they have the returning talent offensively. Um, Last year, I think they just kind of played it safe because they knew their defense was so good. And so they won games like 24, you know, to 14 because they could. I think this year they're they're getting more explosive um, offensively. So I think they, they look good. Um, you know, that NDSU game, you know, at the end of the year, um, it's going to be really interesting. NDSU going to their place. And, um, yeah, I think South Dakota is looking strong. South Dakota has the Jacks in two weeks. That game's in Brookings. That's the other ESPN game that the Missouri Valley picked up. And then uh, they have to go to Grand Forks, and then they have the Bison. That's their last two games of the season. So it's coming at the end of the year uh, for USD. Before I let you go on UND, uh, now with this, they have a bye week, same after the loss. They're 4-2. and two. They still have to play the Jacks and the Coyotes they have both in Grand Forks, and we know how different they are in that building. Uh, What's your prognosis going forward here for UND? Yeah, I I still think they're sitting pretty good, um, you know, record-wise, and just looking at their upcoming schedule. uh, They they do get some of their tougher opponents at home. um, So, I mean – uh, that that's always that's always helpful uh, as well. I think their schedule still sets up nicely to make the playoffs. The, you know, the Montana when you kind of balance where was Montana ranked at the time and also where they're ranked now, and yep. with Montana kind of falling back, that takes the shine off of the win a little bit for UND, uh, but it's still a ranked win um, on on their resume. And so I, I still think the Hawks are are looking good. Um, you know, losing big to NDSU. I don't honestly I don't think it was that big of a surprise. You kind of just felt that NDSU was gonna roll with, you know, it being a senior lane team for NDSU, better quarterback play, it being in the Fargo Dome. And so when the Bison opened up a big lead, I was kind of going, you know, this is maybe this was a little bit expected. And so UND fell back in my ranking. They're, they're still in the top 15, but I still think they're they're a good team. They have a really good backfield. Um, you know, I think the quarterback play with Romfo will get more comfortable as the season progresses. Um, defensively, not their best game, obviously, against the Bison. But I think defensively, you know, they still are um, pretty strong. So, I, you know, UND loses some momentum, obviously, losing a game like this. But at the same time, I still think they have everything in front of them yeah. to to make the playoffs and see. I mean, seeds are now 1 through 16, and so they'll be in the seed discussion somewhere, I think.
Is the time for bracketology or is it too early? <laughs> you got to. Well, I was thinking about <laughs> thinking about starting it this week, but I, like I said off there, I got some got some moving stuff to do. So I I'll, I'll, might have to push bracketology 1.0 uh, uh, to next week because whenever I start it, like the first time I started. There's like five upsets, and I'm like, why did I even do a bracketology? It's just last week's did not mean anything. That's so, very true. Um, it's never too soon for bracketology, but I think I might wait one more week to, to get it going. Is there a team we haven't talked about enough in your mind? I mean, you mentioned maybe it's Abilene, maybe it's Tarleton. Uh, is there anybody out there? We have Davis. Who have we not given enough love to yet? Uh, UC Davis, maybe. Um, Mercer actually, yeah. although we've talked about yeah. we talked about yeah, Mercer a decent yeah. lot on your show, yeah. but they're they're on they're playing really tough defense. Do I think they're a title con- a, a national title contender? No, but I mean, could they go to you know Montana State in the quarterfinals and give them a really good game? I think so. Um, they looked the part there, so those are probably two teams okay. um, right there. Um, Semo is kind of lurking outside the top ten for me. I think they're pretty strong. Uh, I mean, they almost beat Montana a couple of years ago um, in the playoffs. Right. And, and Chattanooga has also risen uh, back up. They kind of fell off a little bit, but they beat ETSU in a defensive battle. Um, so I thought that was impressive. And so they're kind of they're kind of rising up uh, as well. You're the man. Always great to chat. We'll do this again next week. Appreciate the time as always. All right. Sounds good. Thank so you. Sam Murder joining us each and every Monday, 935, to recap the weekend that was in the FCS. We'll break. We come back. We'll wrap up our one. Jeff Kolpak on deck. Big second hour. Your emails are flowing in. How Mike rolls on. Overreaction Monday. Back after this. This is Hot Mike. Hot Mike. On the networks of WDAY. WDAY. Here's Dom Izzo. It's that time. An author. Offensive production number one. Number two. Forgot. <laughs> Golfer. It'd be like going on a three-person best shot, and we were saying, Colpack, you got to make a 25-footer every time. Uh, you wouldn't putt first. I'd have Tim putt first. And one heck of a TV personality. This game is for the Cooper Cup. <laughs> it's the Forum's Jeff Colpack. Four. I should have yelled two. And here he is, folks. Jeff Kolpak joining us bright and early on a Monday morning. Good to see him, my man. You as well. And we got a bunch to get to here. Um, as usual. The first thing I had, I got two emails. <laughs> Donna Jeff, house cam. House cam. That was your headline of your story. It was. On Saturday night. Well, it's what everybody was asking. Yes. You know, and, and actually, I, I got to speak to a journalism class this week, and that's one of the things I'll talk about is, is it's not so much about the game and – and the five-two defense and nope. and the passing attack, I, I a lot of times I try to picture when mom, dad, and the two kids are leaving the dome. What are they talking about? What do they no. talk about when they get in the car? What's the family or or the two buddies who go to Labby's after the game and order a couple cocktails? What are they talking about? And there's certainly two words that they were talking about: okay. house camp, yeah, because camp we yep. there was no you know official diagnosis, I guess, but we think it's a sprained ankle. We see. <laughs> We were told he's fine. That was that was. He could have gone back in the, the game. game. So yeah. we had we can show the video, John, whenever you're ready. The video of the of the actual injury. I mean, it it didn't look great, honestly. When he's running here, you watch his left leg; it buckles under weird. That oh, was right there, yep. right there. Yep. That was the weird part about it there. And obviously, the, the the hit up high, which was the personal foul that happened after it. And then I give a total shout out to our crew because we were uh, eagle eye on this. He went off with Doctor Bruce Pyatt. Uh, off to the locker room afterwards, and you see he was walking pretty gingerly there. And then I watch. We go to break, and you see he was doing this. He comes back out, Colpack, and we did. I don't think we. Okay, I haven't this seen this camera. yet. I haven't yeah. seen him coming back out. He came back, and uh, he was sitting on the trainer's table. And at the time, his dad, uh, Kevin, came down and was asking him how he's doing, and he was he was high fiving. Guys, he was he signed autographs as the game was over. If there, it, to me, and he was standing up at the end of the game. If it was something more to it than that, I don't think he's doing that. Is you know maybe I'm making more out of it than not, but I I didn't get a sense that this was anything beyond what it was. Yep, probably right. So I I, I saw Bruce Pyatt after the game. Yep. He's down there with his family. Um, I think it's his grandson. They're playing football. And I wanted to go up to him and go, how is he? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> That's the reporter it is. We got to find yeah. out what's going on. I Again, Tim Polisic, that was the first question I asked him in the postgame press conference. How is he? He said, he's fine. He could have gone back in the game. 
if we needed him to. And obviously, Cole Payton finished out uh, the rest of the game, and is, he played a heck of a game because the Missouri Valley just announced he was named the Offensive Player of the Week again after his performance on Saturday. And he w- he actually threw some incomplete passes uh, for the first time, really, this season. I know. It's, but, like, shocking. But he, <laughs> it's th- like... he threw two more touchdowns. He broke Easton Sticks' record for most touchdowns uh, by a quarterback. Rushing touchdowns, that is, at 42. Just what else do you say about what we've seen on number he's, seven? He's, he's on that five or six quarterback Mount Rushmore in the Division One era. Yep. With uh, I, I, You start with Walker, then you got Jensen, then you have Stick, then you have or Wentz, then Stick, and then Lance, Trey and now. Yeah. That's a good question or a good point because I got an email here I want to bring up. Uh, if, if Mount Rushmore had that many faces. Yeah, he's, 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 had out another one on that probably, yeah, to uh, extend out. Um, email comes in on this. Uh, Do- this is a long one, so I'll try to break it down. Dom and Jeff, can you touch on the evolution of Cam Miller? He was never supposed to be the guy. In a perfect world, Trey would have been at NDSU until 2022. Right. After that, I think it was supposed to be Cole Payton. Not to undermine what Cole has done his time. There would never have been Nolan or Quincy Patterson, Zeb Nolan or Quincy Patterson. In the world of NIL and the transfer portal, he bought into the program and stayed even when things were not great. I remember the column I did after he rallied the team against Missouri State at home when Quincy was was really struggling. And he came in, and, and I think I uh, the column essentially was, Okay, why didn't you transfer? Because at that yep. point, and that was the start of uh, of transfer happy people. That you know, why didn't you do that? Because you got beat out by Quincy, and and as we've seen, a lot of a lot of people try to find greener pastures. And I think he referenced his dad and and yes. growing up yep. and and playing under a head coach in high school. That this was that, never an option. Yep, yep. it was never discussed. And. You've seen, and Palsek made a very emphatic uh, point about that after the game as well. So this is what it, it can be. This is a perfect way to defend the portal of what the evolution of Cam Miller. And he's that email is dead on because the the line of succession, if you want to go with it, Trey Lance was – let's just say Trey Lance was going to be here three years, right? 19, 20, 21. Mm-hmm. Then Cole Payton is your guy because he would have been then – what is it? He would have been a redshirt – uh, he was sophomore. Well, Cam had to play as a true freshman in that spring Correct. season. People forget that, that right. he was he started two games, two and, playoff games that year. And that kind of references my my column from the game on Saturday. You have Simon Rumpho, albeit in his third year, just so limited yeah. with what he could do with the passing game. And a lot of it, it goes back to he just hasn't played a whole lot. This is his first full time duty. Where Cam is in his fifth year and has seen a boatload of games yeah. and pictures. It's such a difference, and we're gonna. We, you know, eventually transition. SIU's got a true freshman quarterback yeah. now uh, because of injuries. But what a difference! It, it's just it's just crazy how that is. And I, um, you know, enjoy Bison fans to have an experienced in, quarterback. Yeah. Uh, another email comes in here. Dom and Jeff, Coach Polisic press conferences are gold. He gives you little cryptic insights. One non-conference the preseason was his way of validating what he watched while scouting his own team in the offseason. Then he made changes after that. Two, how he uses the media to set the tone for the week. Three, the sound bites on Cam, Bryce Lance, Cody Heisman were great. This team is only scratching its potential. When Tim starts to raise his voice, yeah. I'm going, oh, yeah. boy, where, where are we going Buckle here? Up on that. Yes. <laughs> and so it usually happens once, win or lose. You know, Correct. It's just, yep. uh, I want to finish the point on the portal, and you, you got to be careful what you ask for. I think as we're going along here, as more players are entering the portal, we're seeing more data, more years piling on years. Eli Green has four catches this year. And they were they were in the UND game. UND game, the first game of the season. So he hasn't had a catch since then. Nope. Be careful what you do. It's a, the, the several Bison players after was it the twenty one season or twenty two now? Twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah. There's a five, six, seven yeah. guys went in, and really I think Jazir Cox before that had a good, you know, okay thing at West Virginia. Jabril was at LSU, although they weren't that good. He did. That was he was going to do his deal there. The guys in twenty two left middle of the season, right before the postseason began. Siegel's, the Siegel's been that. productive Marquise at Kansas State. A, yeah, he's an all conference player. He's yep. going to be a draft pick. At Josh Kansas Hayes State. eventually worked off for him. He kind of got lucky that Kleiman took him back but at K State. But right now, there's more. And again, it's early data on. I'm not ready to go there on the guys that left after after last season. But more often than not, you're seeing on national scope. 
more often than not, it has not. And I think it's a, a there. correct thing for a lot of players who don't play. Yeah. If, if you're not playing here, you're fifth in the depth chart. Oh. Yeah. Go find a well, level you can play at. Seth Anderson's a perfect example. Seth wasn't going to play here. He's starting at UND. That was that's a perfect example of a guy that he's just behind too many right. guys. He yeah. wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna pass a Grace Dable. He wasn't gonna pass Mason Miller. Those are guys that came in in his same recruiting class. He goes to UND. Now he's a two year uh, two and a half year starter. That mm-hmm. worked out well on on that. I well two things. The Bryce Lance thing he hit again. He did. Yes, again he did. Yeah. On how the fact that he only had one catch still can't. And if you want to pile on Matt Entz on that, that's fine. But I will, again, say Zach Mathis and Eli Green weren't coming off the field last year. That, that would be my, my counterpoint to that. Mathis was Cam's guy. And Eli from what we, probably oh, the third some, or fourth game. I would say probably yep. the midpoint, probably about this by the midpoint of the season, he was tremendous. He was great. I'm not taking those two guys off. Now, can you debate about having Jake Lippy out there or our guy uh, Giancarlo Volpentesta out there? Yeah, we can have mm-hmm. that conversation. Yep. But Braylon Henderson and Raja Nelson were also in the mix, too. So I I don't know. I mean, hindsight is what it is, Colpack. I'm not sure what, how you handle that conversation. And maybe Bryce has just gotten a lot better, yeah, too, in the offseason. I mean, you can't discount that. Yep. I, I, I We don't watch practice during the season because we just don't. Hey, I don't. We I don't. Probably not even allowed in. We're still. It's the we're same st- amount of access. Yep, it's yep, fifteen minutes. Yep. So. So, and that's not enough to judge a guy's improvement. Maybe he's gotten bigger, stronger, faster yeah. by just a little bit here and there, and you can't discount that either. Last one, Cody Heisman. He, I said it during the game. He yeah, he's game, coming. He had the game of his life on he's Saturday. He was really, really good. That's the second week in a row. Yep. That he's played really well, and that defensive line has played really well. I think That's Eli Mostart in the, in, in the yep. two conference games has yep. really upped his, yep. his Pepper, level of play. Jude Pepper's been really good, too. Heisman's been good. That interior part of the D-line has been really, really good so far since Missouri Valley play started. And I don't think you can discredit this, and I know you guys, I think, mentioned this on the post game. The move of Sam Young to the spot at strong safety seems like it's totally changed this defense that they've, they've become the 85 Bears now. He's making tackles at the line of scrimmage, yes. and that maybe is the difference between strong and free, and we, we beat this to a drum on both pregame, postgame, <laughs> during game, all the game, that uh, the strong safety has more responsibilities yep. with run and, and pass fit conflicts and things like that. And he's a coach's kid. He's a smart kid. He's in his yep. fifth year? Six. Six. He's, he's a, a six-year six guy. guy. He's a six-year guy. He's been around here for a bit. Uh, one other email before we go to break. Cam Miller is playing quarterback at the highest level I've ever seen at NDSU. He doesn't have near the talent on the team as prior quarterbacks, and he's off the charts right now. Debatable. I mean, uh, you're, you're seeing it now. It's hard. Sometimes you forget about how good Easton was. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> I, people, routinely, Carson, I mean, people routinely do that on Easton stick. Yeah. I, I firmly believe that. Carson Wentz and Trey Lance had their, and then obviously because of where they were picked in the NFL draft, but Easton stick. Needs to have his don't his forget Brock Jensen. Brock Jensen was awfully damn good too. And his so last two Walker. years, his last two years, yes. Brock on third down oh, yeah. was I did, money. I did, oh, it was just third Auto- and six automatic seven they were, yards. They were gonna, right, yep. they were gonna get it. Just look if you need anything, look at the Kansas State game to see how good he was. And that's again, I think, and I uh, Trey Lamb said this, and I believe Eddie George said it that there were guys that were that were trying to beat Cam Miller out for the job. Zeb Nolan was one. Mm-hmm. Quincy Patterson was another. And all Miller has done is beat them both. And he's become now, he's going to go down as one of the greatest quarterbacks and in and done history. And very humbly, yeah. too. Yep. And it's just flat out. He will go down as one of the greatest quarterbacks. Regardless of how the season uh, pans out, you're going to look in the record books, and you're going to see his name hit second now in completions. He's now the record setter for uh, quarterback touchdowns. He's going to probably break the yardage. He's going to get at least a second in total yardage in school history. I mean, he's also won a national championship. He's also won, I think, now 36 games as a starter. The one thing he hasn't done is something we're going to talk about. A couple weeks. Is the Jackrabbits yeah. on that. Let's break. We come back. I got a bunch of emails about the Missouri Valley Football Conference. I think oh, that's a really huh. interesting, interesting, to hear this. interesting topic to get to. We'll do that. Much more with Jeff Colback. We roll on an overreaction Monday. We're back after this. Hey, don't forget, tomorrow, Hot Mike. On the road, we'll be at the Premier Center in Sioux Falls for Summit League Basketball Media Day. We're going to have 
Summer League Commissioner Josh Fenton will have both Bison coaches, the UND coaches, the Jackrabbit coaches. Uh, second year in a row for us being down there. The media poll will be unveiled as well. Should be a big day. Get your college basketball season and get your fix tomorrow. Join us tomorrow from Sioux Falls. Say hi to Dave that. Richmond for me. I, I haven't will. seen him lately. I I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure he'll enter where you are. There's no doubt. <laughs> I'm sure. That. I'm He'll sure. be wondering what's going on. Uh, I got a bunch more emails coming in on this particular topic, and I really, uh, I'm glad this came in because I wanted to uh, discuss on this about where where we think the Missouri Valley Football Conference is, mm. and with the, is how top heavy is it, considering the top four teams are all ranked nationally, and then after that, it's a whole lot of average, if not very good. Correct. Why is that the case? I guess is the question. What happened in Northern Iowa? Was uh, the, the budget cuts affect that program so much? I know they're touting reciprocity this week or last week that it's a game changer. So now that's where we're at is yeah. with Northern Iowa is you're hoping that reciprocity will make a difference in in, in funding the program, I guess, and, and the scholarship <laughs> bill. That's not great if you're banking on that. Yeah, I mean, I look at – you could say, and John, you can cut that music when you get a second. Most conference discussion over the last month has been regarding NDSU leaving. Given the current disparity of the current teams, what is the long-term viability of the Missouri Valley? I could easily see three of the Eastern teams leaving. First, I've heard that forever. I, I've, I've led that charge, frankly, on Youngstown to maybe get a to go to the CAA. That's not going to happen. But for years, and I, I looked this stat up on Saturday night, from 2012 to 2017, every team – in the Valley, made the playoffs outside of Mo State and SIU. Oh, good stat. Great nerd stat. And then since 2018 to now, everybody's made it to the postseason. No other FCS league has had that kind of depth. But it has fallen off the table this season. It seems even more especially. Because we know the four Dakota schools are pretty good, right? Although we saw a pretty good disparity, I think, between NDSU and UND on Saturday. After that, though, Jeff, Illinois State, the Bison beat them by 30. Southern Illinois, we'll talk about in a minute here. They're 2-4. and four. They're not very good. Youngstown is awful. Indiana State, we can't just figure it out. Let's, let's Okay, Indiana State, they have not been okay. relevant. So let me since keep them the, out of, okay, I'll keep them out of the since, conversation. Since they shut the down, their program in the pandemic. Youngstown lost nine guys, defensive regulars, yep. to the portal. Yep. Okay, so there's two. two you can take those two. Would my you, best reasoning for those two. Would you put, okay, Northern I, Iowa. I, Budget? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, that, that's, because Northern uh, Iowa get great players all the time. All the time. It's not I like their do. budget has changed a whole lot over the years. No, it's, Northern Iowa actually has had two first round, or two, uh, yeah. a second and a first round pick over the last four years. North, Spencer Brown and the Penning kid were both either in the first well, or the second round okay, of the draft. Uh, they don't have NIL, I don't think. Not they, for football. Uh, nope. They don't have Alston payments. Those are yeah, two things NDSU has. Do yeah. they have cost of attendance? They don't for football. So those, those are three funding yeah. mechanisms that NDSU has that they don't have. Yeah, that one. Because those three schools, I put Youngstown, SIU, and Northern Iowa, you could almost bank on being. And Illinois State is, has flirted with the playoffs. Now, granted, they haven't been since 2019. So it's been a bit for for Illinois State. But it's it, it's not – is nearly as deep. I used to always nickname it the gauntlet. It's not no. that. I don't know if it's that anymore. Because the other schools, most state, Jeff, okay, they bubbled up when Petrina was there, but traditionally they've been bad. And, and state, not eligible this year, right. by the way. Indiana State is the same. I'm not even putting Murray in the conversation because they just got here. But the schools we just, those four, traditionally have been pretty good. And that's not the case nope. in 2024. Nope. Even Western Illinois back in the day used to be Western pretty good. Western made up won a playoff game. People they beat, they beat NDSU here on homecoming when Matt Barr single-handedly beat them. Well, when our guy Bob Nielsen was the coach, they won a first-round playoff game in 2015 before he got the job in Vermillion. Man, I mean, that wasn't that long right? ago. That's not a decade ago when they went and did that. So that just – there has been – Great depth in this league, and it's just not, it's just not there anymore. And I, I it's a variety of things. I, like in football, it's never just one, but budget's a big deal. And you mentioned the, those three mechanisms that both USD, UND, SDSU, and NDSU have. The other schools don't for football. Take away Youngstown, which has a pretty nice indoor. It was one of the first. Yep. The other contenders all have indoor football practice facilities. Yep. And and 
you know, I, I USD has a nice outdoor field, but they have the dome. Correct. For, for you know, the indoor Jacks, use. The Jacks one is immaculate. I've been inside UNDs. It's really good. The Bison one speaks for itself on on what they have. I just and, thought and, was... and Illinois State put up a bubble, which is okay, yeah. but it's a bubble. Right. Like high schools have bubbles now. But it's it's something. They at least they right. are they're addressing it somehow. Right. At least the they're trying to invest not. in the football. Correct. And that's the thing. I, I'll end this with Southern Illinois because we'll chat about this on our video blog coming up later today. Salukis are two and four. They're down to their third string quarterback here. I had, I think, I had high hopes for Nick Hill's team, knowing full well what they lost. That he always brings in some good transfers, but boy, this is you this picked is not SIU good. to beat BYU in the opener. I did. How's, how's that looking that right great? now for you? That's one of the few losses I have. I know. In the FCS <laughs> pick this year was that after one. that, I thought you're going to go down the tubes yeah. in a hurry here. And, but I, I wasn't the only one, by the way, that picked that. But yes, that was not good. And frankly, defensively, is that's the thing where they have looked. But really with the portal, good. you don't know what you have sometimes. Well, clearly they maybe overestimated what you, they had. You, you win by the portal, and you die by the portal. And the fact that they're down to their third string quarterback, who's a true freshman, right. who the Bison are going to see on on Saturday. Was he eighteen, uh, thirty nine, or something like that? Not a good. Yeah. That's not a good combo. Two picks, basically. no touchdowns. The issue. The one thing I throw at you: if Miller is not a hundred percent, do you say you know what? Get ready for the Jacks. We start cold. That's Payton. a good question. I don't know if you want to send that message to yep. your team yep. or to the other team, frankly. Right? That they well. It is homecoming at SIU this week, and maybe that'll this is the account. Second time this year that someone has scheduled. Do you the want Bison to schedule on, the Bison at doing? homecoming? <laughs> right, like that's that's not. Do you, do you want to raise money after the after the game <laughs> to your lums? Well, they're already in basketball mode there yeah. in Carbondale as it is, but uh, that to me is an odd deal. And this used to be a place you were. I remember you told me about this uh, the first time I went to Carbondale in 2012. I want to say 2011. That when the Bison went there in 2005, when Jerry Kill was, Mm -hmm. I mean, this SIU was humming. They were good. They were good. They were so good defensively. They had linebackers who were like 230, 235. And at that point in the Division II day, you just didn't see that. I think Steve got hurt that game, too, if I remember right. Yep. Correct. Hurt his knee in that one. Yep. Um, But that's where, and I would say even when Dale got the job up until the late 20 aughts, right? 2008, 2009. They were consistently making the playoffs, and then it, it was falling off. And, and that cliff 2005 after that. game was at their old stadium, which was a yeah. dump. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. It was just old and a dump. They built this beautiful, beautiful. New, yeah. And, and you're thinking, okay, this is this is FCS title kind of stuff. Like, how can you not get better players there? And the great Jeremy Chin, awesome player. You see him in the NFL. He was darn good at, at Southern Illinois. But uh, I know money now for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. again, we talked about Northern Iowa. Does does SIU have NIL for football? Alston payments cost have, Maybe yeah. do they have? They must have something. I'd have to look onto that. I'm not. I'm not. I don't great know. on that. I know they have it for basketball. I don't know about football. But now it's a good there. recruiting area. Your your Chicago, St. Louis, St. Louis, yep. Memphis. Yep. It's a good recruiting Absolutely. area. But if you don't have the money, I mean, now what? FBS is 107 capped, essentially 107 scholarships. Yep. And so now there's another boatload of players that'll probably go FBS, and then you have to wait for them to come back to the in the portal, and, yep. you, and it's hard to develop guys when you bring them in two, three years after they they were benching it somewhere else. Correct. Uh, your wait is over for midweek football. It starts this week. Oh, Con- Conference USA plays. Oh. <laughs> So tomorrow night you've got the powerhouse matchup of Florida International and Liberty. And then Wednesday night, New Mexico State and Jacksonville State will play. And Thursday, you've got three games on Thursday. Coastal and James Madison. What could have been? Yeah, I just no, look at that. Yeah. The law is just like I look out the window. That's the teams. Middle Tennessee and Louisiana Tech. And your friends from UTEP and Western Kentucky. Yeah, will play I guess Thursday I'm not going to get invited to go You're to not El going Paso. To El pa- no one's inviting you no, to El Paso. I no can expense tell you that. paid trips to El Paso in the near future. That's uh, that's kind of the deal there. But I still look at that and go, I just, I think the Mountain West commissioner panicked. Oh, I, there's no doubt. I think that, but they want to be in business in Texas. They're going to go grab another Texas school. Maybe it's Tarleton that they go and get another FC. But that's the deal. I'm really interested to see what Sac State does. Sac State has made this completely out there, in your face, 
we have this much money, we're going to build a new stadium, but they never cared about football. You know that from the Division Two days. It's such a radical departure from right? how they've done things for years. They've said now that they'll the, the Warriors are going to let them play some basketball games at the Golden State Warriors oh, that's arena back. Oh, no, no, to no, get no. into the Pac-12. No. I mean. They're going <laughs> to. It, it's know. like when IUPUI was playing in the Pacers oh, arena. Oh, yeah, that's right. How'd that go? Not real. Yeah. Not well. Before you well, know it, they were. We'll, we'll see it next week with Tennessee State, or next year at yep. Tennessee State playing, playing at the, the Titans, Titans Stadium. Yep. There's going to be more Bison there, fans I, there. I, I guarantee I you there will. And I don't think there will be a whole lot of Bison fans there. I, I, I'll be. Oh, I, I, I think Nashville is going to be an attraction. Think so? Yes. You see the scene in Nashville? When, Na- when UND hockey was there, it was a Nashville yep. takeover. Yep. Did you see the scene in Nashville this weekend after they <laughs> carry the goalposts out after oh, Vanderbilt? I, I didn't beat see it, but Alabama. I heard about it. They traveled three miles with the goalposts to the Cumberland River and dumped them in. How do you get <laughs> them out of the stadium? Don't you have, you have to angle it, right? To get it out? Well, they didn't bring the whole thing, did they? That the whole, was the whole the thing. The whole goalpost. The whole thing. Wow. Check our guy, Tim Purton, who was there, friend of the show. He had the video on a Twitter well, account. It must have been he a, was right good, there. a good uh, doctorate in geometry. <laughs> That was able well, to it is Vanderbilt. Configure. Yeah, that's it, what I'm it, saying. It it's yeah. the Harvard of the South. As okay, you got to so. turn it 35 degrees this way. They beat Alabama. How do you think that's going for Kalen DeBoer today? Uh, <laughs> is the chair already getting a little warm? <laughs> many, I've seen that today. How many for sale signs do you have in his front yard? They still do Nick that? Saban, what do you say after they yeah. lost? Yeah. He, he stopped at the gas station, and the guy is <laughs> just talking to him, and the guy goes, well, once we get rid of Nick Saban, we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of Nick Saban. By the way, uh, and they kept playing it. Saban said the easiest place in the SEC to win is win at Vanderbilt. They kept playing that all day, Saturday night after that happened. So we got a big week coming. We'll see you in a little bit. We'll see you, video yep. vlog. So Jeff Kolpak joining us each and every Monday off the top here of our second hour. We'll break. We come back. Josh Morton joins us. Augustana Athletic Director after a huge weekend for the Vikings after they beat UND in hockey. Back on Hot Mike on this Monday morning right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Monday morning show rolls on. Overreaction Monday. We mentioned earlier our best of the weekend. Saturday night in Grand Forks. UND had its hockey exhibition opener, and Augustana decided to ruin the party. The Vikings go in and beat UND 4-1, and now... Another milestone win, just their second year as they get ready to be play Division One hockey and a monster win. It's our pleasure to welcome back to our show, Athletic Director Josh Morton joins us this morning. It's great to see you, Morty. I uh, I know the announcement came out last week about the, the future series with UND. Did that get canceled over the weekend after what yeah, happened? No. no, maybe add, add a little more spice to it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they're, they're coming to our place in 27, 28. Then yeah. we get back up to Grand Forks and the next year so um yeah pretty special weekend for us the your backstory with that when the game got announced and knowing full well that the bison und football game was happening the same day i mean did you how how much have you had this circle how long have you had that date circled yeah you know it's been uh i think looking forward to it for a lot of reasons number one it, it starts off our year two right and what coach ravelin's built as you, you mentioned, it, you know, we had a number of signature moments in yeah. year one uh, for a startup program. But then, yeah, the, yeah, I, I would be lying if I said it was just another exhibition game or just another road game. Um, it, it was special. I'm a North Dakota grad, you know, walk on football player, um, worked there for five years, uh, a lot of special memories at UND. So um, absolutely, it was it was it was a date I was looking forward to that challenge for us is we also had a we it was our homecoming football game and a big one against Duluth and we we had a huge crowd great weekend football wins in the last minute so it was a great day for Augustana on Saturday <laughs> what was the I guess for you personally getting into this game and I want to talk about the game in a second excited nervous a little bit of both when you got to the Ralph on on Saturday uh I think excited I I you know the I I I want to see our team play, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a different team than we were in year one. Um, but I know that coach Ravlo and coach Nelson, our, our staff has done such a great job of building this program with a philosophy in mind. That's about really building for the future. Um, so I was just anxious to watch us play. Um, and that, that like a lot of people probably. Right. And so 
um, that, that not just uh, maybe, maybe excited, but it, I always get a little anxious just because of the excitement, <laughs> knowing that I can't control anything. Yeah. So uh, I just get to go and, and cheer them on and be supportive and watch. So the game plays out the way it does. I mean, you just shake your head like, okay, like we're, we're ready to roll here. It's an exhibition game, but we're playing, we're, we're out in front on the road in Grand Forks. And really controlling controlling play yeah. exhibition game for both right we yep. we switched goalies halfway through that was part of the plan um so we had put a freshman in at the end <laughs> um so yeah i think it was just it was just the to see us really not be phased you know, i i've seen i've seen enough games in ralph engelson arena that sometimes the arena takes it out of teams yeah. uh and you let, get a little momentum and all of a sudden boom it's an avalanche and um our guys just took it took it to them right from the start and so uh never really got a chance to get that way so uh yeah i was really proud of how they played and um now now the like any sport now we had you know a six-day turnaround to play i'm glad we played at home i'm glad we will have a great crowd we'll have great energy in midco arena too um so now we just got to bring that same energy on the ice what was the i guess attention like after the game what was was there either a a, you saw either a headline or a tweet or anything and say, well, okay, wow, this, this sent maybe a more shockwaves than I thought of what we did Saturday night. Well, you mentioned that, you know, the, the 1996-97 uh, UND hadn't lost an exhibition. I graduated in 1996. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. that date means something. I, uh, <laughs> I know that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was that and just to, to see the uh, – Great text messages from from friends, both at UND and just an, anywhere else who who saw it, who care about college hockey. Um, so yeah, it was. I, I think just just overall, it it meant a lot. And then uh, it was cool for me. My my parents, you know, were in Fargo, uh, and you know, my dad, uh, mom and dad came up for the game. Had had a good friend fly in from South Carolina for because he wanted to see the Ralph and see Augustana hockey there. So yeah, it was fun. You can mention Scott. They, he's been on the show. He knows everybody it. So knows everybody Scott knows Scotty. Coast so. Coast. He, uh, he's already so, got, he's already got us set up for next year because the Bison play the Citadel in football, so he's got me all set right. up for next year. Yeah, you'll you'll love. So we spent I spent nine years in Charleston, yeah. of course. Yeah, so so it's, it's such a small world, as you know. So <laughs> I'm a former foreign communications employee, right? Got my first job out of college as a sports reporter at WDAY, and uh, then went to Charleston. I end up hiring Scott. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> terrific employee, kid from New York, right in Charleston, South Carolina. Much like a guy from New York comes to Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> um, so before you know it, you guys connect with each other, yeah. and I'm Scott. It, it's 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 a it's a small small oh, world. You're so exactly yeah, right. it's cool to have Scotty and his daughter uh, Aaron with us. That's fantastic. Uh, to to actually have home games in October and November, December for hockey. What's that going to do for excitement around your program now? Yeah, I'm so glad. Last year we we played five games at the Premier Center. Yeah. Awesome facility, right? I mean. But but not ours, and so uh, and then we moved in in January, so we were able to get ten games in in Midco Arena, um, and so for us we learned the building right. You, it wasn't just oh gosh we got two games in and now we got to figure it out for next year. So that was really good. We we know how the building operates on a game night, what our pain points might be. So I feel really good about that going in, and now we have fourteen regular season games, and then you know hopefully a couple of conference tournament games as well. Um, but yeah, it is. You know, college hockey is the longest season known to man, right? I mean, we start in October and the frozen fours in mid-April. Um, so to capture some excitement, I mean, it's supposed to be 80 degrees, I think, again this weekend. So I can imagine we'll have some tailgaters, uh, which will be fun. Uh, we get to experience our first ever hockey football doubleheader weekend. That's oh. going to be great. It's actually when we played uh, University of Sioux Falls. Oh, boy. We host Bemidji and hockey. So man. that's going to be a fun Fun weekend on our campus. A lot of energy around this place. Um, so looking forward to to all those things too. And and you know when when the weather's nice, it may not feel like like hockey weather, but we'll take it because I think I think we'll, we're definitely going to see some tailgaters. Morty, when the CCHA came to you and say we're going to let you in a full year early, was that more than okay? What you've done is impressed, or they needed you, or maybe a combination of both. Yeah, good, good question. You know, it started with a call to Commissioner Lucia. Um, during the year last year, and and it was us saying, hey, you know, we we understand why this was to begin with, and it's what we signed up for, and we get it. 
but it was to kind of let us get our feet underneath us to schedule outside the conference to, you know, to get some momentum. Yeah. And I, you know, when you go on the road, we, we tie and then win a shootout against the dimensional national champions. We then turn around and beat Colorado college the next night. We beat, you know, we, we take Notre Dame to overtime. We sweep St. Thomas felt like, okay, we feel like we're, we've got our feet underneath us. And would there ever be a chance for us to come in a year early? So we put some things on paper and, really pleased with my fellow ADs and the CCHA that recognized it and that kind of rewarded, I think, what this this community and our university has invested in to, to be, to, to compete right away. But it's a huge deal. I mean, for us now in January, February, to be able to um, compete for something, right? We can compete for championships. Um, that, that, that was a huge, huge deal. What has either surprised you or just maybe you didn't know about starting a Division One hockey team? If I would have told you this, you know, four or five years ago, this is what it's going to be. What what has surprised you in this whole this whole run? Oh man, uh, good question. I it's probably a ton of surprises along the way, and the, the journey was just it, it. It's interesting, and the the reason I think last year was really gratifying because the number of people that it took to do it. Right, yeah. it was. You know, we have, it starts with Mr. Sanford, who makes the largest single gift in Augustana history and says, go get others. So that gave us the green light. Okay, we're going to do this. Now let's do it right. And so to see the community get involved, uh, business leaders that recognized it. um, The one thing I think that, so I'll never forget opening, when we opened Midco Arena here, and my office is in Midco Arena, so I'm I'm sitting in it. Um, January 26th, uh, hosting Ferris State. And I, when the gates open, I'm sitting there and I watch a group of students sprint up the stairs to get the best seats. Mm. And I was like, wow, okay, we're on to something here. And then, uh, so we sold out opening weekend, which you, you would hope and expect opening of a new building. But then on a Saturday against Alaska Fairbanks, uh, at the end of the season, we also had to sell out, no. sell out. So that to me meant a lot because it means people are telling other people, it's becoming more than just a hockey game. It's a social event. And so those things that we wanted to bring to Sioux Falls are kind of, we're starting to come to fruition. Now the challenge on us is to keep it going and, and elevate it, right? Every year, kind of find different el- different ways to elevate. So um, I think there were a ton of surprises along the way. And I think the, the way you had to approach it, though, from 2021 to January of 24 was um, little bits and pieces and focus mm-hmm. on focus on taking it day by day. And before you knew it, we were playing hockey. (laughs) I know last week was an emotional roller coaster with, with Chad's passing in the time, in the brief time you got to know him, what, what kind of impact did he make on your university and your hockey team? Yeah. So, so glad that he was with us. Um, He's a fighter, um, intense, but just a great guy to sit around and have a pregame meal with. Um, resonated with our players. I think on the hockey side, he brought a ton on the X's and O's, you know, for, for Garrett and for Taylor. Um, just and for his story was so well documented. Everybody in hockey knew it. And I think for our players, what an incredible lesson. Um, and I really appreciate Garrett's comments over the weekend. You know, it's about how we live. Um, it's not about playing a season for Chad. It's about how we all live because we were touched by him. Um, yeah, just, and then to see, you know, I appreciate UND's um, really, really thoughtful uh, moment of silence yeah. for Chad as well on, on Saturday. Uh, it's devastating when you, you just think about it, you know, we're parents, you, you, uh, he's too young. Yeah. Um, yep. It wasn't, it's not fair. Um, but to see the fight that he had and the things he went through just to be able to coach hockey um, and never complain. Um, just did what he's supposed to do, uh, and was a was a huge part of our first year of Augustana hockey. Well said. There's no easy segue on this, but I have to ask from your time at Michigan State. I'm interested what what the big boys are thinking and not letting any more FCS teams up because obviously you know that's the big deal at NDSU. Yeah. You know you know the the mindset of there. You you worked in the Big Ten. What what is the mindset of okay? We don't want to share any more of the money, so we don't want to let any more FCS teams maybe come up to to the FBS level. Yeah, I uh, good good question. I think as I'm sitting as the athletic director <laughs> at, at Augustana University, Division Two multi sport, Division One hockey, 
I don't think I'm, I don't think I can give you a great answer. <laughs> you know, I think it, things have really changed a lot. Wow. I, you you know what? It, it, those of us who follow and love college athletics, um, it's a different world than it was. Um, and in a year, it's going to be even more different. Um, I think you know, we look at it from the hockey perspective and, OK, we're a Division One hockey program. We follow Division One rules for our one sport. Right. And 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 we're just focused on what what are the ripple effects, right? Because the unintended consequences that maybe weren't a part of this big deal, but there's going to be ripple effects, right, for for all of us. Um, and nobody knows what they are yet. <laughs> it's just there's this this yeah. unknown about what exactly it's going to mean. And just selfishly, just that we're so focused on that. Yeah. What, what does it mean? And then the trickle down for Division Two, you know, if, if so, if there's 105 scholarships at Division One, what what's that? what's that trickle down mean as far as right. the, the talent and, and, and what's their retention going to be like? And what does that mean for division two for, for a, what we consider? We, we always want to be a premier division two Correct. Um, and keep pushing. So um, yeah, I'm fo- focused on what, how it impacts us because it does, it's still college athletics and the, whether it's a trickle down on division two or uh, seeing what division one hockey looks like in the next few years. I don't know. Uh, we're out of time. Next time I got we come back on because I, I we want to do this again. You got to give me a great stay story. He watches he all the time. Oh so my goodness, I know man. you got you probably have like ten, but you got to give me like two that are good for television. Okay. Right. Yeah, well, that, that, give you give me some time to think about it because yes, I have ten off the top of my head. I know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many are are ready for ten. Stay's the best. Yes. Uh, just the one of the best bosses that I ever had. Um. Yeah, had had so much fun working with Stacey. How many times do you give you give you a hard time about white balance? Do you give you that a lot? Oh my goodness! Still, yeah. Well, you, you probably heard some of the same things that I did. Um, yes, like when, <laughs> the times that I get, uh, I would say a phone call. But back then, Dom, I'm not sure we 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 may have had a bag phone, but I'm not sure if we did. It has to wait till I got back to the station. Yeah, right. And got exactly. Chewed, and got chewed out for something. It's great to see you, more. Congrats on the great win. We'll do this again soon, okay? Thanks, Tom. Take care. Good to see you. There he goes. Josh Morton, Augustana Athletic Director, joining us after Augie's big win over UND on Saturday night. We're way overdue for our final break. We'll take it now. We come back. We'll wrap things up. Get you ready. we got a big sports Monday. Hot Mike wraps right after this. All right, let's do some what to watch here as we wrap things up on this Monday morning. A lot to get to. There's a lot of good stuff tonight. Saints and the Chiefs coming up 7-15 on ESPN as the Chiefs look to stay unbeaten. The Saints had a great start to the year. That should be a high-scoring game tonight, 7-15 on ESPN. Just one. We've had a couple back-to-back weeks of two Monday night games. Just one back to usual here tonight. Baseball playoffs continue today. The American League takes center stage. Tigers and the Guardians play game two. It's at 3 o'clock on TBS. And then primetime tonight, Royals and the Yankees, 6.30 on TBS there for game two of that series. Yankees won game one of that one. So each of those games, game twos coming up in the American League, and we'll preview or recap each of those coming up tomorrow uh, on the show. Before we go, uh, I know we had a couple emails on this. Uh, Dom, wondering about the South Dakota State game. I would anticipate... We will know, I would say, probably within the half hour, hour on the game time and the network for the Jackrabbit Bison football game coming up a week from Saturday. The networks are contractually obligated to let teams know 12 days out uh, what network and what time they're playing, so that will be part of it. Uh, I've heard everything from ESPN2 to ESPNU and around 11 a.m., that's the latest I've heard. Uh, nothing concrete on that, but uh, we should know within the hour, I would think, on what time and what channel the Bison of the Jackrabbits are playing on. Again, that's a ESPN exclusive. WDAY does not have the rights uh, to broadcast that one. So when we know, we'll pass that along, and uh, we'll break that down as well coming up on the show uh, tomorrow. We got to roll. Thanks to our guests today, to Jeff Colpack, Sam Herter, and Josh Morton. If you missed any of the show, you can podcast it later today at Inforum. Dot com. You can watch a full replay as well on WDAY+. Plus. Again, tomorrow we're live in Sioux Falls for Summit League Basketball Media Day. Hope everybody has a great Monday. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Hot Mike on WDAY Extra, KSFL-TV, and Inforum.com.